It's his as an academic who teaches, uh, or tries to teach, makes sense of the last three years. Uh, I often say to students, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. It's been a very propitious time for those of us who are engaged in teaching and making sense of recent events, uh, academics and certainly also journalists. Whatever one may think of citizens, as in our professional guise, there's been, been an enormously stimulating period to write and research and to teach. And I've wanted to have our speaker this evening here for many years, and it's been occasioned really by the great success of his book, which happens to be on sale outside, uh, five pounds off, only 15 pounds, and I'd be very happy to sign copies after the lecture. Um, it's a remarkable career, uh, 25 years as economics editor of The Observer, and almost 20 years as virtually emeritus economics editor of The Observer as the principal economic correspondent, before then at the FT. Uh, these are crises of uh, national proportions, and they're crises that he has seen First hand, and so I think this will be an extremely stimulating and interesting talk. And may I ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, William Keegan. Thank you, Mark. Can we everybody here? Yeah. That's a very generous introduction. And um, it's very good to be back in Newcastle. Um, my, I, I knew quite a lot about Newcastle in my, as I grew up. My father was born in Durham, in um, Langley Park. And um, Newcastle and Sunderland were, all, were always in the, um, the family gossip. He was, he was born in 1903. He was in the... Somebody's waving. Can you hear me? You are right? Oh, thanks, thanks. Okay. Um, the, I was accused recently at um, a class, a class I do in the autumn with, with Ed Balls and Nick McPherson and Fall in the Treasury, of not speaking loudly enough. And that's it. that was the first time in my entire life I've been told. My wife says I'm you know, much too noisy. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, he was born in, in, into a mining community, third generation from, from Ireland, and um, First World War. He, when he was um, 15, he was. Um, he was asked to, to join the teacher, the teaching staff at the school as a pupil because the, you know, the masters were all at, at, at the front. The, he played football for Langley Park. And um, for, uh, for a time, I distinctly remember that um, in the way that people often support teams that are, that are far, a long way away from them, um, I used to support uh, Newcastle United. I'm not kidding. Indeed, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm old enough to remember something that Apparently Tony Blair thought he remembered, but he didn't. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember Jackie Milburn, and I can still remember the cup final, Newcastle and Blackpool, where Jackie Milburn got two brilliant goals, at least one of them from outside the penalty area. Those are the days when I understood the rules of football and rugby. I'm not sure that I do anymore. But so I got these, and my father throughout his life um, kept his Durham accent, which, 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 which was great. He came south, and um, he, um, well, he, he was just, a, he, he was a very good trade union man, um, and I owe a lot to him. Anyway, my first visit to Newcastle was um, in the mid-60s, when the Wilson government had come in and they were going to nationalise the steel industry. And as a young journalist, I was invited with a party to uh, come up, this is by the, the private sector steel owners, and so we did a tour of North Dorman Long, South Durham Steel, and Consid Iron. And so we had a good tour of, um, of the area. And uh, I distinctly remember meeting the first celebrity singer I'd ever met. There weren't any more. But we went to the Dolce Vita nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's around the time that the Dolce Vita film I saw about decadence in Italy, which I saw again recently. Anyway, he. Um, um, so, uh, the younger people probably don't know who Mel Tolley is, but he was actually a very good singer. And um, some of his songs like um, Mountain Greenery and uh, Blue Back in Town are still played. Uh, but it, it was quite something to, to meet him. But that, and then my next visit was about 20 years ago when was John Bridge here today, by any chance. John Bridge, I was invited up after meeting John Bridge at the Labour Party conference. He said, about time you wrote about the North East again, and, and so I came up and uh, it was the North Development um, Company. And uh, so I, I, I did actually write a, a column about that visit. 
And uh, here I am again. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, the, um, the book is about um, nine crises. I've, over the years, I, I wrote a book called um, Who Runs the Economy, where with a, another author called Rupert Pedder Ray. And in the end, we decided, uh, in order to pay them, we're not sure who runs the economy. It goes in phases. <laughs> then I wrote a book about, uh, called uh, Mrs. Thatcher's Economic Experiment. And then I wrote another one, uh, Britain, Britain Without Oil, because I was worried that um, the oil was being misused and wasted and not actually invested in, in, in the future. Then uh, uh, when the, the another, uh, I did one called Mr. Lawson's Gamble, which I'll get on to in a minute. And when the, the, um, the wall came down in Berlin and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, I became fascinated by the fact that, you know, I read economics at Cambridge, but Soviet economics were a separate, uh, were a separate um, branch with, with, with their own experts. And there were books around, uh, there was a famous occasion when the World Bank said that the East, East Germany had overtaken um, the UK. Uh, they said this in 79, which gave a bit of propaganda to Mrs. Thatcher during the election campaign. But it was, it was of course, complete rubbish. <laughs> and so my book was called The um, Spectre, you'll remember that Marx wrote about the spectre of communism and called in Europe. I just thought I'd might, might write a world bestseller if I called this The Spectre of Capitalism. Anyway, it wasn't a world bestseller. <laughs> but it did cover, um, I did, it, it, it did, I visited Eastern Europe and, and uh, Soviet Union and uh, discovered that it was, they were really very badly run economies and all sorts of inefficiencies. What's happened since is not necessarily what people hope for. Now, the, the crisis, I joined, I'd always wanted to be a journalist. Um, from the age of seven, I used to write some class newspapers and uh, I also was a journalist at uh, university. Uh, during my time, my grammar school went from college. Um, I edited a, a book, called, uh, sorry, a, a newspaper called The Weekly Whale, and it was all written out in hand and circulated. Um, we didn't, we couldn't, we didn't have copying machines or anything. And when I um, finally um, uh, finished at Cambridge and I was uh, looking to get into journalism, I uh, I read economics, so I heard that financial science that hired graduates. This is a time when journalism wasn't actually uh, that. Um, the media weren't quite as uh, popular as a job as they seem to be now. And I went to see Gordon Newton, the editor of the Financial Times, and he read my cuttings. And the ones I was most proud of, he sniffed at. And one that I thought was a bit embarrassing, he said, this is pretty good, like, we could, we could be up run this in the Financial Times. Anyway, I got a job at the Financial Times. And I worked with Sir Samuel Britton, um, who was the senior economics person there. And we, we started covering these crises. Now, the first crisis was the devaluation of 1967 under Harry Wilson. And uh, this was a, an illustration of uh, one of the recurring themes. Governments come in and often make um, bad decisions straight away, which go on to haunt them. And it was pretty clear to most economists that the pound was overvalued in the sense that exports are too expensive. And there was a balance of payments problem, the trade figures were in the news, and so the economic advice was that the pound needed to be devalued. But Harold Wilson said no, it would not. And uh, so the, the, the next few years, everything was affected by the struggle to preserve the value of the pound, which in 67, uh, it, they finally gave in and it, and it was devalued. And the Wilson government never really recovered from that um, his reputation. In particular, one famous remark where, in order to try, it was divided by 14% against other currencies, but in order to, to explain to people that that, the, that just affected imports, so the actual effect on the standard of living was actually, uh, it wasn't, wasn't so big. But Wilson used the phrase, the pound in your pocket, pocket has not been devalued. But it, it had, it, it had, but it hadn't been devalued by 14%, but that wasn't the point. And he was haunted by this really for the, for the rest of that period, with the result that one of the great uh, aims of that government was uh, to raise the country's economic growth rate. Tell me something new. And uh, they invented a rival to the Treasury called the Department of Economic Affairs. They had a national plan 
Uh, and it wasn't actually as a decade, it was a lot more successful than more recent ones, but it was generally perceived as a failure. Now, um, in 1969, there was an interesting uh, episode which affected the following uh, decade and the next crisis I'm going to talk about. The, uh, it was generally thought that the unions were too powerful, too strong. Uh, my father never believed that. <laughs> but, um, uh, and the, if Labour, rather than the Tories, would be better given it, its links with uh, dealing with them. Uh, and there was a white paper produced uh, called In Place of Strife, which was in 1969. And the idea was that they would try and, and, and rein the power of the unions in, in somewhat. Uh, the, um, anyway, it, 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 they didn't go ahead with this. And the next crisis was uh, a three-day week under T Ted Heath. Ted Heath was Prime Minister from 1970 to 1974. And they, 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 he became obsessed with, with the power of the unions. And also, uh, again, tell me something new, a move towards a freer markets. But what actually, uh, it, it all ended in tears for, for, for Heath. He, um, the problem, the, the key problem looking back on it was that the, they believed in market forces and they wanted to, to rein in the strength, the power of the unions. But around that time, 1973-4, the oil price uh, doubled and doubled again and altogether quintupled. It went up fivefold. And uh, this was brought in by uh, mainly uh, Middle Eastern producers but also Nigeria. And there was an organization called OPEC of, of, of the uh, export, oil exporting countries. Now that meant that energy was much more expensive, but it also meant that when fighting the miners, these a government that believed in market forces was up against the market forces. The, the miners' position was, was very greatly strengthened. The energy was more expensive, and um, in the end, uh, the, the the government uh, Ted Heath went to the country on the issue of who governs. Uh, the, he, the, the, the government or the miners, well, and he lost. Now, in came uh, Labour, and the next crisis was the 1976 one, when we uh, had to go to the International Monetary Fund in humiliating circumstances to, to borrow to prop up the pound because um, the, 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 the loss of confidence, uh, partly because it was argued that the, the government was borrowing too much. But also partly because inflation was absolutely um, devastating. It was, inflation was running at about 25% a year. Now, that wasn't entirely Labour's fault. Um, in one of the, the most mismanaged economic policy decisions of my entire career, uh, but, but introduced with the best of intentions, uh, the Heath government intru uh, introduced something called threshold agreements, whereby they would gear rises their wages to increases in the cost of living. And it was hoped that that way they would contain a wage explosion. But of course the cost of living was going up month after month because of the rise in the oil price. And it got right up to 25%. Labour inherited that and had to, had to fight inflation, go to the IMF, and never really recovered from that episode. The, my next crisis is the, um, is, um, well, it's, it's Thatcherism. Uh, and monetarism, uh, what I call uh, say no monetarism. <laughs> it was the period 1979 to 82 when it was an extraordinary, again, right at the beginning, governments make extraordinary mistakes. They got on, the, the Conservatives had gone on about where Labour's inflation, although they had actually contributed largely to it. When the, the election took place, the inflation rate was 10%. But the, um, the, the government decided to, uh, in, order, in, order, in order to win the election, they made all sorts of wage awards. And they wanted to cut taxes, uh, direct taxes. They were told by the Treasury that in order to finance it, they had to raise indirect taxes. So VAT uh, nearly, nearly doubled. And this had a dramatic effect on the world prices. And so having, having said they would reduce inflation from 10%, well, they then found that a year later, it was 20%. The, um, now my, my friend, I, I, I got to know famous economist J.K. Galbraith quite well, and he, he once uh, had a marvellous sentence about you know, Britain has 
volunteered to be the Friedmanite guinea pig. <laughs> That's a reference to Milton Friedman, who was the apostle of monetarism. And the uh, and Galbraith said the British, with their phlegm, they'll put up this nonsense. Um, but what actually happened was that uh, it was so devastating that the, the monetary squeeze, the, the control of the monetary supply, by the way, didn't work, and they moved on to another way of trying to control inflation. And unemployment went on up and up and up to over 3 million by 19, <coughs> 1986. Now, many years later, um, I was at, um, at a dinner with somebody called Sir Douglas Watts, who had been uh, the head of the permanent Secretary of the Treasury. He said, did you see the Financial Times last Saturday? Um, the, the Milton Friedman has renounced monetarism. <laughs> and I missed this, but it gave me a great scoop because it was, they had this series called Lunch with the FT, which is now, it was on a Saturday, and now there's a whole page. The most interesting thing is, uh, is the menu and whether they had anything to drink. But, but now, and again, now and again, you get some good stuff. And this Lunch with the FT took place with Friedman in, in the early um, part of this, um, this century, uh, 2002 or three. And it was the FT's East Coast, West Coast correspondent at a fish restaurant. And, and Friedman said, well, if I have my time again, I would have, I would have pushed this monetarism. And the FT, did, they printed this in the magazine. And I, I missed it, and, and Douglas was spotted it. And so it gave me a great, um, great column the following week. And Friedman announced his monetarism. And we'd been, the company had been through all that. Now, the next crisis, it was the, 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 uh, the, the Lawson boom and bust. And that there's a sequence here because once again it's inflation. Um, the, 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 they failed, monetarism and controlling the money supply have, have manifestly failed as a way of controlling inflation. The, and Lawson became obsessed by the fact that uh, in Germany, I mean, was it? between the wars, uh, you know, there was hyperinflation in Germany, the Weimar Republic and so on, but after, after the war, uh, the, the Germans got inflation under control for many decades. And so Lawson decided that if we can't control inflation, why don't we just um, you know, try and tie ourselves to the, to the German got the Deutsche Mark, as it were, and hence his efforts to, um, to join the European <coughs> monetary so, uh, system, uh, the European um, exchange rate mechanism. Yeah, he failed several times to persuade Mrs. Thatcher to do that. <coughs> And it's finally done under John, uh, under John Major. But the thing is that um, uh, Lawson was you know, a very um, strong chancellor, and the Treasurer always respects uh, strong chancellors. But it, it all went to his head, and he had, um, you know, he, he, he thought that he actually set up in an economic miracle in the country, uh, and uh, he had a boom, and then um, inflation started going up again to 10%, and the same other problem arose. And when we joined the DRM, it was partly in order to try and get inflation done. Now, it ended in tears with the next uh, crisis I write about, which is the um, Black Wednesday in 1992. Uh, the irony about that was that um, the <coughs> just as they made a mistake in indexing wages at just the wrong time, they, they they tied up with the Deutsche Mark and the exchange rate makers for a long time. I, I referred earlier to the, um, the fall of the wall. And then you had the, the, uh, the reunification of West and East Germany. Now, the, and East Germany was very poor, uh, there, and there was a, uh, inflation took off. The, the cost of um, doing all this where it became inflationary. So that although you, we, we were in the exchange rate mechanism, but it was really controlled by by the German policy. And the Germans wanted to raise interest rates to, get, uh, to, to curb their inflation, whereas we had already got into recession in 1992, and the last thing we wanted was, um, uh, was higher interest rates. And the, in, um, so on September the 16th, 1992, the, uh, there was a huge loss of confidence in the, in the pound. People were selling all over the place. And they raised it in order to the Chancellor, they raised interest rates from 10% to 12.5%. And they announced that they would go up to 15% uh, the following day. A lot of people say they were at, they never got to 15%, but they, a lot of people to, to think they did, they, because in the end, it, 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 we left, left the mechanism about, about um, 7 o'clock uh, that, that day. 
and uh, it was not until the end of that experiment. Now, it, this did mean that out of the, this, out of the constraints of the, the mechanism, uh, the interest rates could come down and um, a recovery, an economic recovery could begin in, in, in the UK. But politically, it was disastrous for, for um, the Tories. And, they know, and, and uh, it was one of the factors that contributed uh, to the, um, their loss in 97. But also, it uh, contributed to the, the rise in influence of the conservative Eurosceptics, who were anti-European anyway, and they blamed um, you know, the leaving the exchange rate mechanism. They, they, they blamed that on, uh, uh, on Europe. And they nagged away at John Major, and then, of course, more recently, um, they, they nagged away at Young. Um, the, the, the next crisis I cover in the book is the financial crisis. Uh, the, now, here we have a situation where inflation was finally under control. The, um, one of my things in this book is that they're always looking for the philosopher's stone, there's always fashion. And they're always looking for the, 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 the answer. And this time, uh, we had the exchange, we had monetarism, we had the exchange rate mechanism, we had indexing wages. It was in, it was um, inflation targets and uh, controlling um, and, and getting the Bank of England involved in that. And inflation around the world, in, in Europe and around the, the world, was pretty low in the um, late uh, the, the late nineties and early part of uh, this, this century. But they, they lost, um, so they thought, right, no problem, inflation is under control. Uh, but it, it coincided with the, the fashion, post the collapse of communism, of deregulation and um, letting, the, letting the banks run wild. And it, it all ended in, in tears with simply um, too much, too much uh, unsecured borrowing. Uh, the reserve ratios, when I was at the, um, the Financial Times, there were very strong rules on, on the, the ratios the banks had to keep with lending, but they just went through the roof. And um, there, we, there we were. But the, this was blamed by the opposition on, on labor and on the spending. But it was basically a banking crisis. And even the, the permanent secretary of the Treasury, uh, um, Nicholas McPherson, who was more of a um, a believer in austerity than I am. He said it was pure, purely and simple, uh, it was a banking crisis. But the propaganda against Labour was enormous and they didn't really recover from, from that. Um, which brings us to, um, it's going to get lighter in a minute, uh, <laughs> but um, austerity. The, we were just beginning to recover from the financial crisis when there was an election in 2010. And in came George Osborne's Chancellor. And really what happened was they, 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 they compared our economy with, with the Greek economy, which was, which was absurd. We were recovering from slowly, and they introduced um, the austerity program, which has lasted a, a very long time, stopped the recovery in its tracks, slowed it down, it badly hit confidence and investment, and went on all um, you know, for 2010 to 2015. Now, the, the, and the trouble is the emphasis is very much on public spending. They actually managed to lower, lower taxes, but, but also cut back on, um, on, on public spending, in particular on local authority grants, where I, I know what's been happening. The Guardian has been writing some good stuff about the, the cuts to local authorities around here and the effect it's had on um, youth centres, sports grounds, and um, general social misery. And I personally think that that was a big crisis and was um, entirely unnecessary. That brings me to the last crisis, um, and that is uh, Brexit. The referendum and Brexit. The ref I think the referendum was, was wildly misconceived and, and was a huge mistake. And um, uh, I, could, I know that the, the, and I think largely the, the, the vote, the, ref the result, was a reaction more against austerity than against Europe. I mean, as far as I work, could see, worries about Europe were tenth on people's lists of, of, of concerns uh, before the referendum. But then, uh, 
I'm afraid rid of campaigns by Nigel Farage and Dr. Kerry, whipping up anti Europeanism. And here we are with uh, leaving the single, well, there, there, there to be a leaving the single market, which Ken Clark, in his memoirs, described as Mrs. Thatcher's greatest achievement uh, of all, joining the single market. And I don't need to tell you what some of the industries around here, which are terribly dependent on the flow of, of goods and parts across the channel to our main market, uh, markets and back again, and all this is, is now threatened. The, so I'm happy to take, to take questions on that, but as I want to lighten light the load a bit now, it's all been a bit heavy. The, uh, during the three-day week, um, there was a minister of the Treasury, the Chief Secretary in charge of public spending, called Patrick Jenkin, who was the um, father of Bernard Jenkin, a well-known Brexit man now. And Patrick Jenkin, uh, the, during the three-day week, there was a curfew, a television I think went off at 10 o'clock or 10.30, and people were told to turn their lights up. And Patrick Jenkins actually said, you want to brush your teeth in the, park, in the, in the dark. So uh, an enterprising Fleet Street newspaper sent reporters up with cameras to where Patrick Jenkins lived <laughs> and on the Holly Lodge estate in Highgate. All the lights blazing. <laughs> All the lights blazing. Um, it was just it was an, it was an extraordinary episode. The, um, um, the, I know it was something I wanted to mention. The, yeah, there was a great, um, <coughs> around the devaluation time, um, we, the, 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 the country adopted decimal currency, and Jim Callahan uh, was uh, Chancellor, and I took the opportunity, those of, those of us of a certain age will remember how heavy the coins were in those days, and they, they were really, so I, I said to, to a Labour Chancellor, and at a press conference, I said, can't you do something about the, the weight of the currency? And he said, if you feel so strongly about that, you could get your tailor to put in reinforced pockets. <laughs> so, so it's just chancellor. <laughs> the, uh, I want to give you another example of um, how uh, expectations um, can go awry. Uh, the, the, on the eve of the 92 election, which um, they were going to loss. I was at uh, the Ascot races uh, with some friends, and they were so certain that the Tories were going to lose that they were offering six to one against Tories. Six to one against. Two horse race. And it's one of my great regrets that I didn't put my life <laughs> on my arm. <clears throat> it was another time when I, I, you know, I, I knew um, Ken Beryl quite well, who was the Chief Economic Advisor of the Treasury during the, the 70s crisis. And uh, one day, <clears throat> Ken went into the, uh, the pub across the road, the, the Red Lion in Whitehall, and he heard some people uh, talking about the crisis. And he couldn't resist it. He, was, he, he said, excuse me, he said, um, it's not quite like that. You, know, you don't really understand. I said, no, who are you? He said, well, I'm the Chief Economic Advisor of the Treasury. They like said, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I'm, um, my name's, um, uh, what's his name, sorry, I've lost it. Um, uh, no, uh, sorry, <laughs> what's his name? And I'm, um, no, I'm, I'm really sorry, I've lost it. I'm really lost it. But the, and there was another occasion when the, uh, in, during, just before the, the, uh, the Black Wednesday crisis, Norman Lamont was Chancellor, and I was <coughs> staying. Um, no, yes, I remember now. Ken said, Yeah, yeah this bloke said to Ken, and I'm the Queen of Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to the survey, you can't be seen in a moment. It comes a few minutes. <laughs> <So> anyway, <coughs> anyway they were, there was a crisis going on before Black Wednesday, it was August, and we happened to be on holiday with my favourite conservative politician of all time, Sir Ian Gilmore, who had the, had the distinction of being fired by Mrs. Thatcher for opposing Thatcherism while he was in the cabinet. He came up to me one day while and he said, he said, I've got a great story to you next time. Said, What's that? The, the, um, he said, the Treasury just rang up to say, is Norman Lamont staying here? And uh, he said, oh, obviously not. He said, you've got your headline for next Sunday. Treasury loses chance in Tuscany. <laughs> 
There was another occasion when, 1979, um, when the, the, the tourists came in, and well, like Ian Gilmore, Jim Pryor was a much more cautious person. He wasn't totally, you know, he wasn't really that bad at all. And his political advisor said he'd like to meet me because he was reading my columns. So I went along and to Jim and Tommy, and he said, "What on earth is this government up to?" I thought, "Hang on, you're in the cabinet." <laughs> Um, and after many years, I was um, awarded the, um, the, the, the CBE, and we had, there were various other honours which I turned out. I thought a German shouldn't um, accept honours, but when I reached the age, I, I was in 2008, well, maybe it's about time, I said to my wife, should, uh, should I accept this? And she said, well, you see, her father was a CB and he just died. He said, we've been, he, her father was the director general of the GLC, senior son of son. And um, she said, well, dad's died, let's try and keep it in the family. <laughs> <laughs> so I went along, um, the, the queen was there, and I went up and received it. And um, she said, and what are you? <laughs> I said, well, I write about uh, the economy for the, um, for the Observer newspaper. And she looked completely blank. Silent. So I said, um, uh, I saw. Um, I said I saw your horse um, win at Ascot. She hadn't had a winner for ten years. Free agent, and she beamed. And then I said, unfortunately, I didn't back it. <laughs> and, and she laughed, which was great. And I. Um, it was really nice actually, because my wife said the puppy owned it the only time she laughed. And, and also, one other thing I, I talked about the financial, uh, I said I was one of the people who didn't warn you. Because she, she, when she opened a new building at LSE, she said, Why did nobody see it coming? Her parents remarked about the financial crisis. And so that was, um, that, that, that was quite good fun. Um, now, one other point um, before we get on to. Oh, yes, I, I must. I must the, um, I worked for a time uh, for what was then called the Daily Mail and News Chronicle, not the paper it is now. It was actually you know, quite a liberal paper, but in the end it went the way of all flesh. And I worked for, for um, um, a city editor called Patrick Sullivan. He was a great friend of Reginald Morley, who was then the uh, Chancellor of Exchequer, 1964, uh, shortly before the election. And one day, Sergeant lived in some style, chauffeur driven and um, all the best restaurants. He taught me a few bad habits, actually. But he, um, his chauffeur came up to me once. He said, Yeah, he said, oh, he's asked me to take this book to, to, to our Reggie. Um, um, he said, Do you want to look at it? And um, he had the, the Drinking Man's Diet. <laughs> and inside, it began by saying, um, Worried about your drinking? Don't worry. Pour yourself a glass. <laughs> um, now, and also from those days, the I um, a very interesting lesson in how journalists must be careful. I did an interview with the chairman of the Alliance Building Society in Brighton, and I was about the time of my first marriage. We were about to buy a house in Canterbury Square, a singular Georgian house, fantastic square, and. In those days, it was ten and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> now it'd be about ten million, I think. But, but this chap, this chap said grandly to me, "Any time you need a mortgage, just, 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 just let me know." Just let me know. And uh, so, so I got in touch with them down there. They wouldn't touch the house in Camden Square, and uh, you've got to keep away from, from, from promises like that. Um, the. the Another story which you may be interested in is that um, I got to know, and know very well now, the man who was effectively fired from the, uh, from the government for warning them about the problems of Brexit. Sir Ivan Rogers, who was um, our man, you know, our ambassador to Brussels, when he came back to London. And he, um, you know, when I met him for the first time, uh, I told him that um, I'd put £20 on, although I obviously didn't want Brexit, I'd put, I put £20 on it as a sort of, just as a consolation prize. And he said, only £20? <laughs> <laughs> he 
can see it coming. And if you look him up on, you know, on the websites and so on, he's been consistently right about the whole process. And they didn't listen to him. And it's almost unbelievable this, but when they, uh, that, when he came back to London, the leading Brexit of these ministers uh, uh, met him, and it became quite clear to them. To, he had to explain to them what the single market was and what the single market was. They just didn't know. Um, so I've, um, I've been serious, and I've given you a few stories. And if anybody would like any questions, Thank you very much for that, Bill. Uh, nine crises, uh, which was the worst? I think this one. This is the first. The, all the others were the result of um, external events or just policies that went wrong. This is self inflicted. This is self inflicted. And all the serious. I mean, we know that Michael Gove doesn't believe in experts, but all the serious analysis suggests there's been really real trouble ahead. But the trouble is, I think the people who thought it was a mistake to give the impression that, again, it was for, to give the impression there'd been a major crisis. It's a pounding go down, but it's going to be, it's going to be a long, prolonged crisis with companies having to adjust in all sorts of ways. I mean, the, I knew Peter Walker quite well. He was a minister um, you know, under the Thatcher government, one of the better ones. And he did a lot of work attracting uh, industry to you know, Japanese, to the north, and to Wales. And this is all done on the basis that this would be, the, the UK would be a base for European operations. And this is all now threatened. Um, it is a unique crisis in that sense. I was struck by the idea of the what ifs I had. Ian McLeod not died shortly after becoming Chancellor in 1970, for example, had Wilson devalued as he was advised to. I mean, these, these are quite poignant moments, they are, aren't they? They are. Um, and um, well, it was quite funny, when I saw the title, I thought, you know, there's an old economist joke, it's difficult enough to forecast the past. <laughs> <laughs> Our immediate present is uh, some questions and comments from the floor. We have two ready microphones. Uh, if you catch my eye, I will direct one of them towards you. Uh, one on this side, one on this side. So please, we have a, a first comment or question from the audience. Yes, please, on the front row here, please. And do we have a second one over here? Um, if we do, just catch my eye during the question. Yes, please. Hello there. Um, what has been the effect of the markets on, on this uh, crisis? And how has the markets responded to us leaving the EU? <clears throat> the markets um, have been pretty effective throughout the opening period. Probably they were, it, it was the market's loss of confidence in Sterling that, that led to the crisis in the 60s. In the 60s. The, um, uh, if you go, uh, let's see, um, la la Labour governments and opposition, they're always terrified of the market, so they therefore try to um, cultivate the city. And there was a famous occasion when John Smith, as um, Shadow Chancellor, embarked on what um, was known as the prawn cocktail circuit. It was prawn cocktails with the, the people around them in the city of London. And, and uh, Michael Heseltine famously observed that never had so many thousands of crustaceans died in a <laughs> so, And I think because Labour Labour's history haunted by the devaluation of um, 1949 and, and 67, and also the gold standard in the, in the 20s and 30s, they, 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 they always worry. And I think that it's a reasonable criticism of the, the Blair Brown government that um, they lent over backwards to please the city. and. Um, Looking at the famous phrase light touch regulation. And there seems little doubt now that um, the, uh, the light touch regulation I refer, you know, led to a lot of excesses. And um, they didn't really, they, they, they just felt they, they, they had to do this, so they were always slightly terrified. Well, I'm just thinking about Dan, I haven't mentioned Dan Seeley. Um, his, um, uh, he was. Uh, 
I think it was one of the toughest, most interesting chances of all. I, I got to know him quite well. And um, he dismissed some criticism of the city by saying, teenage scribbles, he said, teenage scribbles. And um, so it has nothing to do with the markets, but it's a story I thought you might like. Um, uh, in 1907, uh, there was a Commonwealth announcement meeting in Barbados. And Healy was um, chancellor. And um, he gave a press conference. And then somebody said to me, um, he just talked to these journalists alone. And I went to go, he said, yeah, just buy me a drink. We went, we went to um, the bar by the, you know, by the sand. And he unveiled, um, basically unveiled a mini budget. He gave a, 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 a story of what was going to happen, what he was going to do when he got back to, to England. And um, I, I, was, I, I then joined the Observer. And it was a little bit, I couldn't write about this because of uh, the, the, my paper came out on Sunday. And uh, Yorick Martin of the FT, who was the Washington correspondent, said to me that he just heard some hot news from Washington that the chap called Bert Lance, who was famous then, but very few people remember, had resigned, and he had to write a 2,000 word piece. So he subcontracted, although I'd left the Financial Times, he subcontracted this story to me, provided I wrote it under his name, and gave me $70 cash. <laughs> Uh, we have a question on the left up here, please. Um, when you say that the Brexit referendum, or the decision to do it, was a terrible miscalculation, do you mean that um, the timing of it, post-austerity for the Conservative government, or the decision to do it on the whole was a miscalculation? I, I think the decision on the whole. They, the, 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 the Cameron famously said he wanted to you know, deal with this with your, your um, problem forever, and he did it a different way from uh, uh, that's what he expected. Um, I just don't think there was any need to do it. And we seem to have had a series of, um, of, of, of mistakes. You, met, you, you, um, you mentioned the, um, the death of the McLeod, but the, um, the George Osborne was, you see, um, Cameron and Osborne thought they must learn uh, from what went wrong with Blair and Brown. And as you know, there was te terrible fighting between the, the Blair and Brown camps. And, uh, um, I mean, I read a book about Blair and Brown, but it, it was really, it didn't, it, it, they did a lot of good things, but it, it was, far from Iraq, but it was, um, uh, it, 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 it was very corrosive. So, uh, Osborne and Cameron were determined to keep to Sitka. Now, Osborne said that he was against the referendum, but I think if he, if, I think he should have you know, made it clear. I don't. I, well, we, I, we gather a chance to uh, resign and be pushed out today. But they, the Tories had lost. How, they, they, Nigel Lawson had resigned in, 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 um, during the Thatcher government, and um, they they didn't want um, to lose a chance. He, he could. I think he could have. Well, we'll never know. But I think he could have threatened to resign if they wanted. If, he was strong enough. He didn't. You said in your talk that the Treasury likes strong chancellors. Have we lost one today? Have we gained one? <laughs> the, the, um, the, as you understand, all the papers that all weekend said that the chancellor was safe. <laughs> <laughs> the street of shame, my old friend Richard England was called. Anyway, um, the, we, it, it was generally perceived as not being particularly strong chancellor. And the, his successor is quite highly rated by, um, by some of his officials. Um, but I, you know, I just think it's monstrous what's happening here, this, this fellow coming. I think, just, I, think it can't, I think it's going to end in tears. And, uh, I think, I think, but the, the, this, it, this is coming, it's getting rid of the chancellor. But it's coming right, and this is one of Thatcher's lines that there are too many classicists and historians in the Treasury rather than people with uh, different skill sets, and widening the talent pool would mean these crises are less likely in the future. I, I, I'm all in favour of widening the talent pool, but um, there, are, you know, there are ways of doing it. He's, I think he's, taken, he's got too many fights on and too many fronts, but he has got the blessing of Alexander Johnson. As of today, that's very clear. Yes, a question there. Thank you. Um, I'm surely, uh, you, you think... Can I have a bit closer to the mic? Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, 
Do you think in the next five to ten years uh, you, the UK will go down considerably? And if so, how do you think it's going to be sold to the average working uh, people so that there's no return to uh, the EU? Yeah, well, I, I do think that um, it certainly... We are now in a situation where the productivity apparently rises by near one percent a year, uh, which is slower than the, uh, the two to two and a half or three percent we've had for decades. Now that has an impact all around. Uh, the, um, it, it's very difficult to read the, the next um, that this government now because Javi, Javi was saying uh, that um, uh, we've, uh, we've got to stay open and get, get far away from, from European regulation. Um, and Johnson seems to, Johnson says one thing one day and one the next. You can't, you can't, you really can't believe a word that you say, it's not worth the paper it's written on it. But the, um, I, I do think it, not only, I think that we, there's, a, there's a world, you know, there's a world crisis here. The, um, uh, uh, this, um, if, we, if we start with the, the China, the defense on China, there's, there's, there are trade wars between the United States and China. And now we have this terrible uh, virus which is affecting, in a world where iPhones are made in China, where there are all sorts of parts moving around. So there's a, very, there's a short term world crisis. The German economy has slowed down. And so, although I think things are far worse by our leaving Europe, um, it's, uh, it, there's nevertheless um, a, a, a rather general problem of slower economic growth. And then how do you get, to, how do you come to terms with, with global warming? Well, I'm probably not the only journal, I mean, there, there, there are articles about global warming all the time. Um, but then you read that there are going to be new, um, the, the, the Japan is about to build 12 or something new power, coal-fired power stations. And um, we know what Trump thinks about, um, about uh, the climate change. So there, there are all sorts of problems on the horizon. The, the, the fashionable economist solution is to have a carbon tax to, you know, to work. To, a mixture of s s governments getting together and using the market with uh, a higher price for carbon. But, we, I mean, throughout the time uh, I, I was covering these crises, well, at least one good thing was that you had a fair amount of international cooperation which was born of the the horrors of the, 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 the problems between the wars, and afterwards, you know, Marshall Plan and um, uh, the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development set up the IMF, the World Bank. There was a lot of cooperation between nations, and that does seem to be breaking down. And why anybody would want to tie themselves to, to, to Trump rather than to Europe, I just can't really understand. I have a question over here, please. Should, um, should government or financial authorities have seen the um, big crash coming? Or could any of these um, mistakes and crises have been avoided? Well, I think the, there were there were people who did um, did warn, um, but it was if you remember the the, the new millennium. Um, uh, that period when when they were they were um, they thought they had inflation under control. Well, they did, but at, at, um, at the expense of other things. Alan Greenspan was the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, and a book there was a book written by him called Maestro, and um, he thought that all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds. They uh, controlled inflation, and that the markets um, could price risk. Effectively, and there was an economist. Who he subsequently became. He was at the IMF. And he subsequently became governor of the Bank of India. And he was named as a possible governor of the Bank of England to um, succeed Carney, but he he he, he didn't. He didn't and I don't think he. I don't think he wanted to. I'm not sure. Called Ray Burr, Mr. Raghur um, Rajan. He was at a conference, a central language conference, um, in America. I believe. To, uh, 2005, I think, he warned that, that it was all going to end in tears, and he had some good arguments about the, uh, the, the capital ratio getting out of control and wild, um, wild ending and boring. 
and he was just laughed at. <laughs> he, was, he was laughed. He was laughed out of court uh, by Greenspan and also by um, Larry Summers, who was a distinguished um, Harvard economist. So there were some people around, but on the whole, the, the consensus was that um, you know, there wasn't a problem. And, and we saw that. So the Queen was right to say, why well, the babies, well, somebody saw it coming along. Uh, question over here, there used to be an assumption that um, a rise in gross domestic product would lead to an increase in quality of life, largely because quality of life was measured in materialistic terms. What do you think the future of the relationship is going to be? Well, I think that um, the gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services, it's, a, it's imperfect, and uh, in one sense, well, it's probably the, it's probably the best measure we have, but obviously um, quality of it, within GDP there are all sorts of things, but uh, the, the quality of life is, um, uh, it, it, it is more complicated than, than mere GDP, and of course the distribution of it, and we all know what's been happening, you know, a lot of people are suffering, a lot of people haven't had an increase in their quality of life for, for quite a long time. So it's, um, but, G, uh, but GDP is as good a guide, as you, a general guide, as you can get them. The problem is how is it distributed? And it's pretty clear most people now that um, uh, such growth as there has been, most of it has been concentrated on the, you know, the higher earners and the, the, the very rich. The, when in, in the 70s, um, the top rate of tax was um, 83%. In 1979, when we the top rate of tax was um, 83% on income. And, 98% on um, investment income, um, you know, it's obviously uh, ridiculously high. And, um, but w when those rates came down, it did, so far from um, you know, people being um, restrained, you know, the, the exec executives and um, uh, uh, people in the city being restrained about their, their wage claims, so they, they just awarded themselves more and more. And you see these ridiculous sums now, mid, you know, mid, they pay themselves millions. Um, and uh, the, the sort of the culture of, of um, the, the very rich, it, 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 it's quite extraordinary. I mean, with, ex with exception. Um, my, my wife is, um, uh, my wife is um, a, a, a barrister who um, specializes in, um, among other things, in, in football clubs. And she sometimes meets um, people who, um, uh, she, she had one chap who, um, she said, why do you want to buy this football club? And he said, well, you know, my friends have got flats in London, flats in Monaco, they've got yachts, they've got private jets, and some of them have got football clubs. Is that your So my question's a bit more about your time as a journalist as opposed to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm focusing my dissertation around New Labour. And I was just uh, wondering what your thoughts were on uh, dealings with New Labour and their spin doctors as a journalist. I'm sorry. Oh, over here. Sorry. 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 How did you find your dealings with New Labour and their spin doctors um, uh, compared to like other governments? And uh, so, for example, with the Charlie Whe Whelan leaking, uh, the decision on the euro, and were you involved? Did you, did you get information on that? Well, not um, these days. I just I write my my column once a fortnight, and I keep in you know keep in touch with a lot of people. But um, for a long time, I was also reporting and rushing around more than, than I do now. And I knew um, I, I, I know Charlie. I knew Charlie. I know Charlie well. I got to know Ed Ball very well. And the I, I think the um, it, journalists have got to get to know good sources. And the key thing is, I think, is trust between them. So people will, you, if, you, if you have a reasonable reputation for being, being trusted, then people will give you, talk quite frankly. And um, uh, they will, um, uh, and if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. But I think, what, I think there's been a change in that um, pe the, the tradition, people like, um, Joe Haynes, who was the press man, Harold Wilson, um, Bernard Ingham, Mr. Thatcher, 
they would put, they try to do, put the best face on policy and they try, they, they try to avoid telling you things they don't want to tell you. But they wouldn't actually lie. I never came across anybody who lied to me. But it's, um, that, that's all changed. You know. it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, it, it's, um, it doesn't just apply in journalism. But, um, and was, well, I thought that, um, yeah, I mean, I know Alistair Campbell, but he was um, there again. I mean, they get passionately involved with their bosses and want to you know, do the best for their bosses. But um, I, I, I personally have never had experience of being, um, of being this way. Mm. Mm. Oh, once. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't a spin doctor. Um, the, uh, the same, the Patrick Jen Jenkin I mentioned just now, when he was Chief Secretary. Uh, we, um, the senior person on the, on the FT and I took him to lunch at, um, at a hotel in London. In London, and it was a Friday, and the question, there was a lot of speculation: were, were there going to be any public spending was, as you were getting, you know, getting quite high? Were they going to reduce measures to stop it? And um, he said, no, they, they weren't. And on the Monday they did. So <laughs> they made they made um, complete fools of uh, us and the financial times. But it, it, it was um, it was a minister, not not a spindle. What's his name? Bob thereafter. Did you trust well, I never trust him again. <laughs> Following on from a previous question, what do you think are the effects on our society of the corrosive inequality and government-induced poverty that we're seeing now? Yeah, I think, well, I think they're terrible. I mean, they really are terrible. It's all around us. And the, you cannot now... If I left my um, house in Elizington, went into town with a hundred pound coins in my pocket, and I gave to everybody begging, they'd all be gone in that day. It's, it's just really, it's really terrible. And uh, the, uh, clearly there's a lot of, um, the, the you know, the, you know about the social services, but the, the, the police, the hospitals are overloaded with, with um, people waiting to be served, the, and the treated, and um, the, the, the police are half the time trying to be social workers, uh, and it's anecdotal, but it's difficult to not to associate um, this explosion of night crime, uh, sorry, knife crime, with the, the closing of um, uh, youth clubs and uh, of uh, um, recreation grounds. Uh, and uh, so it's, I mean, for me, you know, when I grew up, I worked on thinking that society would somehow get better. And it's, it's really not. I think, it's, so I think, I think the, the effects I agree with are very corrosive. The question is right far back. Oh, hello. Do you think Gordon Brown should be made to apologise for selling our gold at uh, bottom dollar? And uh, related question, do you think any event or conditions could ever lead to, lead to hyperinflation in the UK? I can't see any hyperinflation in the UK in the, in the, in the near future. Um, but no, the, the gold thing was more complicated. The, actually, Ken Clark wanted to sell it beforehand. The, I've gone into that. Uh, it, it's all quite technical, but well, I have covered that issue in, in a book I wrote called The Prudence of Mr. Gordon Brown. But no, I don't think he should. No, it, it, was, it was much exaggerated. Oh, which reminds you, though, the, 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 when Labour lost in, in 2010 and uh, the, the, the Conservatives came in, um, they, the Conservatives made much of a note that the retiring Chief Secretary had said, uh, saying there's no money there. Now this was just, this was a, a joke. There was a treasury tradition for years that the retiring chief secretary would leave, leave a, a private joke. And, um, and that was an example of, uh, and they made, they, it was very effective in propaganda because a lot of people you know, actually believed that there was plenty of money, they'd borrow away. But, um, and um, it, I'm harking back to better days when Jim, when Jim Callahan took over from Reginald Morning at the treasury in 64. The, on the, 
Richard Morley told him on the way out, he said, um, sorry about the state of the books I've got. But that didn't get into the, that, that wasn't suddenly proclaimed in the paper. Right. Well, as a journalist, I think something should, should be kept discreet for some years. It came out in the memoirs later. Mm. Me and Burns were at the I was uh, very interested to hear your point about uh, defining the state being made known in government. Could you hold a bit closer, please? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, defining mistakes made early. Yeah. 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 I'm just wondering about the HS2 uh, session. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I, I find, um, I've so far not written about HS2. I just, I find it um, very, it just seems to me that um, the major transport links are further, you know, up here, further north, ought to be sorted out. And I can't understand. I, we've got ch we've got children at, um, at, at, at Leeds University. It takes it just takes two hours from King's Cross to Leeds, and it's um, that's fine by me. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to knock off twenty minutes. It's quite clear there are a lot of problems with transport, but it, but but uh, HS2 isn't um, it doesn't seem to deal deal with it, but there we are. They they decided it's going to be a running story. Um, I mean, I'm not a transport expert like a really expert, but I, I'm slightly surprised. Yeah. Okay. And we're back over the far corner. Yeah. 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 So a bit, hold, a bit closer, please, if you mind. Thank you. Um, has there been a particular chancellor or government whose economic strategy you really liked? Uh -huh. <laughs> no. um, I liked the. I, I liked Dennis. I thought I was a great admirer of Dennis Hedges. It was a very difficult situation we inherited in, in 1974, and. Um, he and Callaghan, between them, managed to keep the, um, the cabinet together during the '76 crisis. But that was more, I think, a lot of um, a lot of tactics. That, that I, I liked. I liked Gordon Brown's. I think Blair and Brown realised that um, there were a lot of things going wrong in society, and I think they, although Blair will never, you know, he's always going to be associated with, with Iraq. But I think they, they, I think New Labour did a lot of good things, and I think that Gordon Brown was, um, uh, on the whole, um, uh, had the right approach, and I think that the, 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 the opposition and others much exaggerated the degree. Spending was never really out of control. It was, um, uh, so I, I thought his strategy was, was quite good. But when he became Prime Minister, he, he, he seemed to be at a loss, and he didn't really, and he wanted it all that time, and um, he, he wasn't um, treated very well by, 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 by the press. Or, and yet, I think that he was the right person in the right place at the right time for the handling of the banking crisis. Because uh, it, was a real, it was a real day of total collapse then. And Gordon Brown had been the chairman of the IMS political <coughs> committee for nine years. He had all the contacts. And people like Obama and Sarkozy in France, was, they gave him great praise for the uh, his reaction, which was they got to um, they got to although you may not like the banks, you've got to save the banks, you've got to save the system, and also for the the, the Keynesian uh, public spending, uh, the the the, um, uh, the the policy of um, doing anything to um, to get the economy recovery again. As I said earlier, the trouble was they don't sat on that recovery. Here, um, thank you very much for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, like a number of people in the room, I'm a grandfather, and um, quite often I talk to my grandchildren about what you've been talking about, about Britain's past and Britain's present. What I'd like to ask you is, what would be in the column you write in five years from now, about your hopes fulfilled? It would only be if the, it was recognized that 
was even the unusual Muslim disaster, and uh, we ought to go back to it. But I'm not, I'm not very hopeful about that. I mean, I remember the, and no, you will have done, you will do the efforts we made to get in in the first place. And I mean, I would say in, in one lecture I can't, but I remind you, I just can't tell everything. But I, I, it's very important part of the um, of my career has been covering Europe, and in the the sixties. Harold Millen uh, tried to get in to Europe and failed, and Wilson tried um, to get in and failed, and eventually Ted Heath did. And Ted Heath had a very good relationship with Pompidou, who was the, the president, uh, the French president at the time, because De Gaulle, as president, was just uh, not, um, he wasn't going to let us join. So it took us ages, ages and ages to join. And um, this process of disengagement is going to be very weird, and we don't, I don't think they really know what they're doing. But there might come a point if we wanted to go back, they'd say, you know, we've had enough. Um, but I suppose the grandchildren, the, 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 I, th I think it's going to be um, the, the big issue seems to be climate change and global warming. That seems to be on everybody's um, lips. The other thing is that um, we all grew up, or most of us grew up with. Um, career structures, but there's less of that now, and uh, people all this gig economy stuff, and uh, it's, um, it, it, it's rather sad, and frankly, I never thought that uh, we'd have so many problems. Somehow, we had this vision that things would get better. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, austerity became a common sense approach to the economy, and if so, how? No, I don't think it was a common sense approach at all. Austerity was a common sense approach in, 19, in after the war, because the entire economy, most economy, was geared to the war effort, and there were no there were no goods available. It took years to, to rebuild the economy, and therefore you had to have ration books, and you had to tax tax people to stop them spending because there was nothing to spend on. But gradually, things got better. There was a great book called The Age of Austerity, edited by. Uh, Philip French, who also was the observer of film critic, really a great friend of mine. Uh, and um, that covers that period brilliantly. But this, Osborne seized on, he actually read that book and seized on the title and made austerity into a necessary policy. But it wasn't. I mean, you know, the, the, the result is the economy grew more slowly, and that aggravated the kind of problems that we've been discussing. And the last one here, please. Given that they, um, UK economy is where it is today, mm -hmm. and that you've spent years criticizing how we have got here. Mm -hmm. If someone waved a magic wand and asked you what you think should be done now for the best, how would you advise the government? I thought I'd say that, <coughs> I'd say that um, you know, Johnson's reported recently is wanting 5% cuts in public spending outside certain areas. He says he believes in the health service, so we'll see about that, but I, I would stop these cuts immediately. I would um, say that um, whether or not we spend on HS2, interest rates are very low. There's nothing wrong with, just as people borrow to buy a house, there's nothing wrong with the nation borrowing for um, important infrastructure uh, uh, projects. But I, I think that um, you've got to look at the social fabric. You've got to, Stop cutting local authority grants. Get local authorities who know the problem. Immediately, double the, you know, go back to um, the problem. Some of these cuts are just ridiculous. And, so, and even now, there's more cuts coming, although they say it's the end of austerity. So I would advise them to reverse the entire the policy and start again. Does that. <laughs> a concluding question, if I may. Uh, we've had these crises. Uh, are we uniquely bad in this country at running an economy? Do other countries have nine crises as well? Or is it a peculiarly British condition? <laughs> the, if you look at America, whatever Trump said, the, um, a lot of people are, are suffering. You know, most of the tax cuts are going to the rich. So I think that I think that it's being run wrong. I think America is being run rather badly. Um, in Germany, um, the despite all the division and the, the important historical um, steps taken to reunite Germany, the um, 
obviously um, it hasn't been handled very well. You've got the rise of the extreme right in the, in the former, <coughs> it, well, in East Germany, the former Eastern Germany, but East Germany. Um, Italy, we all love Italy, but goodness knows how, they, how it survives, but it does. You know, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic country, but um, they're always um, they're, they're, they're always having problems. France. Um, no, I, I think all countries have problems, but this, I do somehow feel that um, we've um, that we've kind of specialised in crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Something we're still good at. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this evening's talk. You can meet the speaker outside. But before then, would you please join me in thanking William Williams.